Welcome to this first edition of New Energy for Europe, a regular news program that shows how green hydrogen will be key to a carbon-free future, that shows how this aging continent will be woken up by the rise of a mega billion hydrogen fuel industry, how countries are taking first steps, and it's very exciting. But first, a message at our request from EU Energy Commissioner Kadri Simpson. Today, around 60 megawatts of electrolyzers have been tested and demonstrated in the EU. By the end of 2024, we aim to have 6 gigawatts of electrolyzers. To achieve these objectives, we not only need to scale up individual plants, but we need to develop a true hydrogen ecosystem and supply chain for storing, transporting and delivering hydrogen to the end consumers. Furthermore, investments will be needed to transform our industrial processes and to develop the hydrogen trucks, boats and planes needed in the future. As such, this creates an enormous industrial opportunity for the EU. Thank you. For the basics about how green hydrogen is produced, from water through green electricity, and why it is so attractive, well, because it's emission free and with hydrogen, you can store and transport the fluctuating output of renewable energy. For more on how it works, you can visit our website. OK, former politician Maria van der Hooven is quite familiar with the promise of hydrogen. For some, it felt like it would never be more than an everlasting promise. But the situation has changed completely, says the former Dutch Minister of Economic Affairs and Executive Director of the International Energy Agency in Paris, Maria van der Hooven. What I've seen in the last few years is that it is accelerating. And I think that is very, very important because, you know, in my view, and I know, I know I'm not the only one to think about it like that, hydrogen is really is a missing link in our whole energy conversion. And that's exactly why the EU has to invest now in technology, in the learning curve to bring costs down. Hydrogen allows renewable energy to expand limitlessly because now green electricity from wind and solar can be stored. And transporting hydrogen gas molecules is much cheaper than transporting electrons via heavy electricity cables. So things are moving. And this, I think, is also creating a new kind of optimism. But let me be very frank about that. I really do hope that we are not going to make the same kind of mistake that we did in the past, where we invested a lot in intellectual property and in um, the uh, development of renewables. And then the production of the industry went abroad. It's a grand project for Europe, a way to revitalize the economy says Maria van der Hooven. What strikes me is that in the middle of this whole turmoil we are in now, of this pandemic of COVID-19, there is a new, um, how shall I put it, there's a French word for the élan. There is a new thinking about the future. And that is where this whole energy transition, and including, and including hydrogen, is part of. So it's more than a project, it's part of our future. Hydrogen will have a big impact in sectors that are hard to electrify. Take steel producers. Steelmaking is one of the most energy intensive industries. But they too seem to have spotted the possibilities of green hydrogen. With Swedish Finnish, SSAB on the forefront. In the far north of Europe, SSAB aims to be the first steel company in the world to bring fossil free steel to the market as early as 2026. The way to do that is through hydrogen. Well, actually, uh, hydrogen is not just a fuel for us because it's more like a raw material in, in our new process. And, and the idea is that we will um, replace coal in the uh, iron or reduction with green hydrogen. And that means, of course, that the, 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 the CO2 emissions that we have today will be turned to, into uh, water vapor. The hydrogen gas that needs to be injected into the ovens will be produced by wind energy. If you look at like uh, wind power, the, the progress has been phenomenal over the few years, how much more um, effective these new tur turbines are compared to the ones that, let's say, five years ago were on the market. So it's, uh, it's getting more and more interesting and the price of electricity seems to go down. 
and uh, the price of CO2 emissions will go up. So I think that this balance will make these new techniques very, very interesting for everybody. As for the hydrogen production, are you betting on onshore wind energy or would you think uh, offshore wind energy will deliver this? Yeah, the, the size of the um, new wind power, like the tower and, and the place and everything, is so huge that it's quite difficult actually to erect them on, on land anymore. So it's easier to go offshore and, and erect the new wind farms there. But yes, it is one of the focus areas for the future energy system here in, in the Nordic countries. The sky is the limit and the ocean is the limit. Because once you're able to create enormous wind parks far offshore, the possibilities to make green electricity and store it into hydrogen are endless. These opportunities are recognised by Irish developer Simply Blue Energy. Her name is Val Cummins, director at the Simply Blue Energy Group, and she's using an interesting metaphor. Ireland has been slow to the party in relation to offshore wind, it, it must be said. Um, but now that it's arrived at the party, it's absolutely ready to dance. Um, so I think Ireland is, is unique because we have such a vast marine territory, um, over seven times our land mass. Um, we have an incredible offshore wind resource, of course, that comes with that. And the government, of course, is committed now through the Climate Action Plan um, to uh, a target of five gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. But um, floating is really going to be the game changer. And floating wind in the Celtic Sea off the south coast and off the west coast in the Atlantic is, is really a huge opportunity. So as well as the five gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030, the Irish government has actually in the programme for government stated an ambition of 30 gigawatts of floating wind for export. The two dance partners here are floating wind energy and green hydrogen. Together, they can turn Ireland into a green gulf. So the opportunity is to start now and to gear up um, for the industrialization of floating offshore wind now. And there's almost a parallel trajectory, as I see it, in terms of how floating wind is taking off in the same way that green hydrogen production is an enormous opportunity for Ireland. And it's when these two things come together and this decade being such an extraordinary decade for these things to accelerate um, that we'll see Ireland potentially shifting its position. The opportunity is there from being a net energy importer with issues around energy security to, of course, um, being what we call now a green gulf, potentially, in terms of being able to export energy from floating wind and hydrogen production is going to be key to achieving that um, access to the export market because we won't be able to do it all with interconnectors or moving electrons alone. We found this so amazing that we asked Delft University of Technology to paint a picture of how these huge, heavy turbines can float in deep sea. Yes, yeah, so floating offshore wind turbines, uh, they are supported by a floating support structure that is moored to the seabed. And this allows for wind turbines to be installed in much deeper sea than with conventional bottom-mounted foundations. Uh, several concepts of floaters currently exist and they can, broadly speaking, be separated into three main categories. Uh, as we see here on the left-hand side, we have sparboys, semi-submersibles, and tension neck platforms. And the choice of the specific floater uh, is not necessarily obvious. It depends on many factors, and it's not clear today what the best option is for a given site and a given wind turbine architecture. The countries of Southern Europe seem to be fully capable too of producing clean hydrogen at relatively low costs within some years. The blueprints are there, according to Portuguese Minister of Climate Action, Matos Fernandes. We believe that a country from Southern Europe, like Portugal, can have an active role in push forward the broad use of hydrogen, particularly green hydrogen becoming a key element in accomplishing Europe's decarbonisation goals. During the next decade, we aim to achieve 2 to 2.5 gigawatt of installed capacity to produce hydrogen, between 10% to 15% of hydrogen injected into the natural gas grids, between 50 to 100 hydrogen filling stations. And this objective translates into investments around to 7 to 9 billion euros. 
Solar parks in the sunny Algarve region will power the production of hydrogen, but also wind energy on the Atlantic Ocean could play a future role. For both options, the Harbour of Signs is a crucial location. With the current infrastructures, such as, such as the deep water port of Siemens and the availability of vast and diversified endogenous renewable resources, we have all the conditions to be a reference in the production, the consumption and export of green hydrogen. So Portugal has the potential to be an exporter of green hydrogen. And that's of interest for investors and entrepreneurs like Mark Rector, based in Portugal and active on the solar front. As we've seen with solar, where um, the massification of uh, or industrialization of production of solar equipment has driven costs down by about 95% over the past 12, 13 years or so, amazing. Um, we can see a similar cost compression curve on the ele electrolyzer industry that has only just started to scale up. Uh, and so you put those two together and then it is perfectly possible to calculate uh, mathematically what uh, the price compression is going to be over the next five to ten years. We see that uh, towards the second half of this decade that the combination of very low cost uh, solar electricity and low cost electrolyzers are going to be perfectly capable to produce green hydrogen at highly competitive rates. Mark Rechter's company, Resilient Group, has proposed to build a 1,000 megawatt electrolyzer in Portugal and is launching a large-scale PV manufacturing initiative for Southern Europe later this year. Uh, that itself sets the scene for an enormous, uh, what I would call, green industrial renaissance. So I would say that uh, although we have a huge challenge in terms of climate change and decarbonization, we have probably an even bigger opportunity uh, to create economic growth, jobs, uh, prosperity, and uh, I would say even social stability. A green industrial renaissance. These impactful developments may still sound a bit abstract to a wider audience, but that will be different from the moment your house is getting heated by hydrogen. This is High Street, a test site in Northumberland near the Scottish border. And these three houses are fitted with hydrogen boilers. Well, over 200 tests took place uh, on these specific three houses, which are in the middle of nowhere. There's a cooker as well in there, there's a gas-fired cooker. So hydrogen can substitute natural gas in buildings. All that is needed is to replace the burners in the boiler and stove, an operation in which Worcester Bosch and Baxi Heating UK, both partners in the so-called H21 project, succeeded. It's very similar to a, a natural gas boiler. 95% of the hydrogen boiler has received its components from a known uh, natural gas version, but the efficiency of the boiler is similar. Around 85% of UK homes are currently connected to the natural gas grid. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, says Martin Bridges. Reuse it. it there's 136,000 miles of gas pipe under the ground zigzagging its way around the country. So it's, in, it's a remarkable public asset uh, and it would be such a crying shame to disconnect it and let it rot under the ground. We wanted to demonstrate to policy makers and civil servants and government ministers that it is very possible to create a suite of hydrogen appliances which could run from a carbon-free gas. And that's led the government now in the UK to fund larger trials. Let's switch now to one of the leading European voices for the hydrogen economy, Ad van Wyk from Delft University of Technology. Ad, you're a professor in future energy systems. I guess it's not so futuristic anymore, though. Yes, indeed. Future energy systems, uh, the technology about uh, hydrogen, which, by the way, is not a technology, it is an energy carrier, but it is not longer as uh, science fiction. The future will be here in the uh, in a, in a couple of years. So where do you see the biggest uh, opportunities for green hydrogen add? First of all, of course, the biggest opportunity for hydrogen is that you can transport and store the cheap renewable electricity from solar and wind to uh, where, what, wherever you want to use that energy. Yeah? So that's the biggest opportunity 
uh, why we will get hydrogen in our energy system. And then, of course, you can use that, uh, that hydrogen in hard to abate sectors, as they call it. And that is, for example, as a feedstock in the chemical industry, but also in the steel to produce uh, uh, green steel, uh, but also in uh, heavy transport, uh, mobility for trucks, buses, planes, uh, boats, ships, uh, but also in uh, sectors, uh, for example, the electricity sector uh, as, uh, uh, as storage and balancing for producing at the moment that you don't have the, uh, the renewable electricity. And of course, for heating houses, but also for high temperature heat. Uh, at places where it is difficult to, to do it with uh, electricity or another uh, uh, heat kit or whatever. Is the continent on track to become a global leader in green hydrogen? It's not one thing that we have to change. We need to speed up the production of green hydrogen. We need to have an infrastructure and storage system in place that can be done by retrofitting the gas uh, pipelines. And we need to retrofit all the appliances and uh, equipment to use hydrogen instead of coal or natural gas or oil. So, and that in the same time. So it is a difficult, very difficult task that we have to do. It is a systemic change and that is always difficult. Are we on track? Yeah, for the moment we are on track, but it is really the realization that, that yeah, needs to be done in the coming decade. It's no longer talking, we have to, uh, to do something. To do something. Exactly right. And this is what uh, this program is all about, uh, inspiring that action as well. Uh, further, further afield uh, outside of Europe, can we leverage other countries' uh, potential when it comes to renewable energies and hydrogen? Yes, indeed. That is a very good uh, question because when you look to Europe, uh, Europe is, of course, in the, uh, the size of Europe is, is quite small. Uh, if you look, for example, to the Sahara Desert, that has two times the size of Europe. In general, uh, in the countries uh, around uh, Europe, you could say, and that is on the one hand North Africa, but on the other hand, uh, you can also go to Iceland, to Scotland, where they have, uh, uh, on Iceland, they have hydropower. On Scotland, they have much better wind speeds and also at the North Sea, far further uh, offshore, there the wind speeds are much higher. And when you look to this, Europe as alone cannot provide all the energy that they need, renewable energy that they need for their own. They have to rely on imports because there you have better resources, there you have the, the, the space to, to build it. And then North Africa, but also uh, Iceland, Norway, uh, are, are uh, countries where you have very, very good resources. And then you have also much cheaper uh, uh, energy from uh, hydrogen in this case, from these areas than that you can produce, uh, for example, inland in, uh, in, in Germany. Thank you very much, Adven Weig from Delft University of Technology. Thanks for watching our first bulletin. Within one or two weeks, you can expect our next edition. Sign up on the website to be notified about this and leave your ideas for future programs. This is newenergyforeurope.com.